Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Um, we have Pat here for the second interview today. We're going to talk about um, Pat's um, role as a senior scientist at AstraZeneca, and we'll talk about um, being a scientist in a big pharma, essentially, and what it's like. So Pat, again, thank you so much for being here with us and you know, sh sharing your knowledge with people, which obviously I can't, you know, I'm not a scientist at, um, at big pharma. So Pat, please tell us what is actually like to be a scientist, you know, in AstraZeneca. Well, short answer: it feels good. It feels good to be a scientist. Well, I assume you want a bit of a longer version than that. So, let, where do we begin? It actually feels quite nice and relaxed. I'd say. Sure, there. Every job has its stresses. No, sometimes you forget something, and oh no, I have a deadline tomorrow. You have to do things. Sure, that does happen. But overall, if I average everything, it's a very relaxed thing. You go in at nine, you do your work, you take a lunch break, you then finish at like, what, four o'clock, maybe 4.30, just wrap up things, you know, answer a few emails, set up your notes for tomorrow, and then you go home. So it's a stable nine to five job. And it's very relaxing in that sense, because you have, a, you have sort of like a schedule, you have things to do, you have ideas that you want to pursue, but there's never any sort of looming deadlines that really push you to work past the hours to work on the weekends to do things that you don't really want to mm, sure so then you know what are the common misconceptions that you had or people might have about you know working as a scientist in industry because honestly what i've heard when i was a phd student is that oh you're just gonna keep doing pcr to every day for eight hours or be very repetitive <laughs> it will not be stimulating at all so Please enlighten us, Pat. Yes, um, I was actually thinking about the about this when you said, and in my mind, I just conjure up an image. So imagine myself at the very end of the PhD when I'm just thinking, what is industry? This scary dark lands, you know, where we shouldn't go in the distance. And I was imagining just being a, at a sort of factory setting where you just constantly do something and just do it again. And as you describe it, it could be a PCR, it could be culturing cells, but repetitive tasks, the same thing again and again and again. And yeah, I was really wrong. Uh, that is not how industry is, at least at least the big pharma is not at all like that. So what, what is it like? I was about to say, like, what do I actually do? Well, I'd probably say that my job is mostly three things. The first one is, well, as a scientist, you do science. I guess that's self-explanatory. You come in, you plan an experiment, you do the experiment, you analyze the data, you write it up, you create a report, kind of create a sort of data package, this one big data clump that then you can give to management, give to people in control who then can make key financial decisions. So should we proceed this further? Should we, com should we continue producing this drug? Should we perhaps stop this drug because it is not up to the standards that we have? Like it doesn't reach the quality control we want for it, that, those sort of things. So that's the first part. The second part is actually the sort of research research, I would say, because I'm reaching out to other teams to find people who are researching new techniques, new modalities, new sort of avenues to pursue. We're actually talking with teams overseas and looking at things that we can implement in our projects. And it's just fascinating to work on new things. I would probably compare to how CRISPR broke through into every bit of academia. Same here. Sometimes you have a new technology just break through through everything you do and you're just excited to use it. You know, you're, you find that joy like, oh, will it work on my project? Will it make it better, faster, more efficient, will it be slower? So that's the second part, the actual mm -hmm. research, research. And then the last bit, being a senior scientist, is the sort of managerial role. I basically supervise employees and I try to provide them a sort of an environment where they can grow, where they can develop, where they can flourish and learn new things and hopefully expand their knowledge so provide a nice healthy environment for them of course absolutely so but um what is it like from the um you know the, the intellectually challenging stimulating perspective so you know when you were a phd student you kept coming up with uh, experiments and, and you know and designing your research and you were you were pushed by your um supervisor do you feel like you're being pushed and stimulated intellectually all the time, every day, or from time to time? What is it like? 
I will say that I have been in my current position for nearly three years now. Well, not in the current position. Uh, I've been promoted along the lines, but still in the same company for three years. And I have to say, every day I was still kind of stimulated because there's new things to learn. There's new techniques to develop. There's new things to observe others do. And so I still keep on improving. And on top of that, I have ownership of a project which I've been working on for the past two years now, which I find truly fascinating. It's something that hopefully will lead to, to a very big improvement. And mm. I always try to find new literature, try to draw in like bits of knowledge from something and improve it. And yeah, I'm very happy. Every day is a is a scientist day. You know, you come in and you just look, hmm, how can I make this better? Okay, so this sounds basically like you're doing another PhD. Like you have a project for two years, but it's running already for two years. <laughs> you're doing research, you know, reading papers and trying trying to well. Well, I was going to say, you know, it does sound like doing a PhD, but I think we both of us went through the ringer of a PhD. And you remember those days when you, you know, you try to figure out, oh, I'd love to use CRISPR, new fancy technique, but at the same time, mm. Mm, it's a bit expensive. How about I use this something older, just like, you know, classical plasma transfection? Well, that's both of us experienced that PhD is now you take ownership of it, but you're really constricted by funding, by time, by just sheer, sheer manpower, because you're the only person working on it. Here, as I said, I have a team of people who work with me on that. And if I need help, I can draw them in. I can ask them to help me out with a task, with something. And on top of that, I think this kind of speaks to the ethos and the sort of overall structure of what is academia and what is industry. Academia is about a scientist publishing a paper. That's the sort of main idea of it. And so Ooh. it guides the whole process. You do, you do work, you do the data, you write it, you maybe collaborate, but you still aim to publish. In industry, you aim to make the process more efficient. You aim to produce more you know, vaccines, more drugs, more, more pills. Essentially, you want to make the patients suffer less and increase their quality of life. So how do you do that? By making the drugs cheaper, by making more of those drugs, by making them faster, by making them higher quality, by making them better at it. And so to solve all of these, you know, just, you're just given money just here. Here's a bag mm. of cash. Just do something, just solve these problems. Mm. So instead of having problems to break through into the paper in industry, I find it's just, you're pushed to solve it. And so it's a lot easier because you're not really slowed down by all these problems. Mm, of course. So basically you're saying that you're doing a, a PhD, but the cash is not an issue anymore. I would actually say so. Yeah, it sounds very Scrooge McDuck of me to say it, but essentially you're given a PhD, you're given a, a golden credit card. Yeah, just spend your money on it. And you're also given uh, a second person to help you out, you know, just just in case you get a flu or in case you need to go on annual leave, they just step in and do the work. So it's like a PhD, but with certain key things that are a little bit different. Mm, that is brilliant, Pat. But to be fair, that sounds like the dream of every scientist, every researcher to just do science and don't worry about the money. Don't worry <laughs> about the funding. True, but at the same time, I'm not gonna say that it's all you know, all uh, all glory from there on. A lot of us do want to publish, do want to find our name there. It's a sort of mark of prestige, you know, just the same as we all achieve those two letters, the doctor at the start of the name. Because it might sound vain, but we all want that. It's the same here. Mm -hmm. We all want to be the the author that publishes. We all want to be something like uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Charpentier or you know Jer Jennifer Doudna, who basically worked on CRISPR and who are now of course, notorious yes. in the science world. So we want our names out there. With industry, it's a lot less chance of that happening. So I will not lie. There's pros and cons to each. So okay, so. Let's talk about then, you know, the progression, the career trajectory. So um, how did you advance first from a scientist to a senior scientist? And then, you know, what happens next? How can you become a principal scientist? Yes, yeah, so I would probably boil it down to two things because the way I progressed it and the way I see people I managed who I want to see progress, it's reliability and inquisitiveness. So you want to be reliable. I want to be able to come to you and say, 
Matt, please, can you help me solve this problem? I have two weeks. And then you tell me that you can either solve it in two weeks or you say that I cannot do it. Please see another person to, for that. I That is the sort of reliability I want to see. Because if you tell me, oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll work on this. And then you write back to me two months later saying, oh, yeah, I forgot it by the side, but I'll finish this this weekend. That, mm. That's not going to cut. It needs to be reliable, stable. I need to know that you know, the, the whole overall project, the overall thing will continue to work on. And the second part, how you get promoted, is inquisitiveness. I'd say the sort of desire to learn more. As an example, I currently have a person who I manage that not only asks what to do, but why we do it. What's the reasoning behind it? What's the sort of logic hidden behind our common steps? And that inquisitiveness leads to a personal growth leads them to develop their skills and find new avenues. And mm -hmm. that just signals scientific mindset. And that's how we get promoted because we want those people who are keen to solve problems. We're not looking for a person who already knows how to solve them because yes, okay, I, I can hire somebody who knows how to solve gene editing. That's great. Next problem is growing those cells. If, if mm -hmm. they are not interested in growing them, then what's the point of that employee? But if I hire somebody who says, I don't know how to do gene editing, but I'd love to learn. Yeah, you're hired. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. So moving forward, you're a senior scientist. And one day, the next step would be potentially to become a principal scientist. So what, what do you need to accomplish to get to that stage? So a senior scientist and a principal scientist, they differ in the sort of scope of their activities. I take care of a project. I take care of uh, sharpening that project. I take care of the science behind it. As a principal scientist, as a sort of investigator, how do you improve the overall like junction of multiple projects? And at this point, you have to sort of think about how does industry work? Because as I said, academia is fragmented. Industry has a overarching agenda to make drugs, to make more of them, to make them cheaper and better. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. what sort of projects, and at this point, multiple projects, you know, uh, pill packaging, vaccine development, uh, virus analysis, uh, employee management, you have to draw them all together and think at the same time about the whole picture and about each one specifically. So to become a principal investigator, you need to know a little bit of all of those and be keen mm -hmm. to integrate them all together into a unified structure. Because as a senior scientist, you work on a single project and trying to understand it. As a principal, you work on many projects and trying to understand them. Mm, that's, no, but that sounds perfect. And yeah, that, that is actually a really, really nice job to have. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, and then let's wrap up this um, for our viewers. Um, and then in the next episode, let's focus for oh well, let's focus on the recruitment and interviews so people know how we can actually get there. Um, so my last question for um, this this part of the interview about um, your job is what can people expect in terms of starting salary, and then how much could they potentially earn? You know, if they progress to the principal scientist role. Yes. So the, the current senior scientist in sort of like pharma industry in the sort of biopharmaceuticals is around 50,000 a year. However, it really, really depends on the industry, on the position, on the seniority. And so it's difficult really to say, to say because I know for a fact that if you move to something that is associated with pharmaceuticals, for example, packaging, mm -hmm. that pays a lot differently than something in my field, which is gene editing. So I'd really say that you need to do a bit of research into the salary and what sort of things to expect. And at this point, I have to say something that I was working on in my early days when I was applying for jobs really helped me was to research the positions on online websites that say the average like salaries, what to expect, mm -hmm. what's the range. One of those that I have used is called Glassdoor, and I, I could personally vouch for that, but I'm sure there are plenty of other alternatives. So dear listener, if you're listening to this, just do a little bit of research and kind of see what you would be expecting. Yeah, definitely. I use Glassdoor myself as well. I think it's a very useful tool to figure out, you know, how much you should be paid um, and how much to say uh, you would like to 
how much you'd like to receive um, when you when you talk to the HR people during your interviews. Right. Okay, Pat. Let's talk about the interviews in the next one. Um, thank you so much for this, and I will see you and everyone else next week. Thank you, Pat. Thank you.